you'll hear a woman complaining about an item she has bought. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Smart Electricals, Mike speaking. How may I help you today? Ah,、oh, good morning. I'm calling to complain about an item I recently purchased from your company. I'm not happy with it. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I'll take you through the company's complaints procedure. I'll need to retrieve your files from our records so that we can discuss the problem properly and find a solution. I'll need to take some details from you first. Is that okay? Okay, but I don't have a lot of time. Will it take long? Not long, madam. Can I first take your name? Yes, it's Susan York. Y O R K E. Okay. Can I have the address, please? Yes, it's flat one, twenty-five Alpine Avenue. That's A L P I N E Avenue, Harchester. The postcode is H A six five L D. Okay. Next, could you give me your telephone number, preferably one that we can call you on during normal working hours? Well, the home one is o one seven three four, five two five two six eight, but you're only likely to catch me on that number in the evenings. I usually have my mobile phone with me during the day, though. It's probably best to take that number then. All right, my mobile number is o seven eight one two double three four five two. And do you have the order reference number on you by any chance? Well, I have the receipt that the camera came with in front of me. Ah, good. Which number is it? It's a bit confusing. It should be the seven-digit number on the top left corner of your invoice. Let me have a look. I need my glasses. Found it. It's D M X eight double four three. Thanks. Now, when did you purchase the item? Well, the camera was delivered last Monday, on the first of February. I ordered it online about two weeks before that, but I can't remember the exact date. If you have another look on the invoice receipt, the date should be there. Oh yes, here it is, January the fifteenth. Okay, I'll make a note of that. So the item is a digital camera. Yes, it's the Aqua PowerShot model in silver. Thank you. Did you take out any kind of insurance when you bought it? Well, no. It was on special offer. I didn't need to pay any extra for the insurance because it came with a special four-star policy. Well, it means you're fully covered for at least another three years. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Right. What is the problem? Yes, the first thing is that it came with one memory card in the box when there were supposed to be two. Oh dear, I'm terribly sorry about that. It must have been an oversight in the packing department. I can do something about that straight away and get one sent out to you. Well, that's not the only thing. I bought it as a present for my niece because she loves swimming. It said on the website that it was waterproof, 
But when she took it on holiday and tried to use it underwater, it got ruined because water got into the lens. You can imagine how disappointed my niece was. I certainly can. Were those the only problems? No, there was one other thing. It came with a case to protect it. When I opened the box to take the case out, I saw that it had a big scratch on it. We're really sorry about that. I can offer to have the camera repaired for you. In the event that it can't be repaired, we'll send you a replacement. Um, I don't think so. Seeing as it was faulty in the first place, I wouldn't want another one. I think I'd rather have my money back. Can I get a refund? Yes, of course. If you send it back to customer services, I'll make sure it's dealt with. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a tutor and two students discussing modern European writers. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. OK, so to continue our look at modern European writers who have focused on the future in their work, today we're talking about H.G. Wells. Last week, I asked you both to do some background research on Wells, which we're going to discuss now. Gitanjali, tell us about H.G. Wells. Right. So, H.G. Wells was a hugely successful British science fiction writer. Writing at the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th century, and much of his work focused on predicting the future. Jason, do you think Wells was just using the future as a narrative device in his fiction? No, no. He really believed we can predict the future. In fact, he gave a speech at the Royal Institution in London in 1902 called The Discovery of the Future, and the point he was making was that by looking at what you know about the present and about science, it's quite possible to predict the future. Indeed. Gitanjali, do you think Wells was always optimistic in his predictions? Not at all. In fact, he varied in his predictions from being extremely pessimistic about the future to being optimistic. Interestingly, one theory I read links the attitude in Wells' work to his own health. When he was writing The Time Machine, which was published in 1895, he'd just been diagnosed with an incurable fatal disease. Not surprisingly, the book is very pessimistic. Being about a dystopia in the future, a long time in the future, the year 802-701 in fact, where there are two races on Earth, the Morlocks and the Eloi, and the Morlocks actually eat the Eloi. I thought it was interesting, though, that it was H.G. Wells who actually came up with the phrase time machine. So despite being pessimistic, the work has had a lasting effect on our culture. Right. After the time machine, though, H.G. Wells didn't die, of course. And his recovery might be why he began to be a bit more optimistic about the future. So that brings us to his first utopia, Anticipations. Jason, 
Tell us about that. Well, Anticipations, or to give it its full title, Anticipations of the Reaction of the Mechanical and Scientific Progress Upon Human Life and Scientific Thought, was published in 1901 and was set in the New Republic of the year 2000. Some of the things Wells predicts are fairly close to our reality today, including 24-hour news, global telecommunications, and even a European Union. We'll come back to the accuracy of Wells's predictions a little later. Gitanjali, how was Wells's work received at the time? Well, although Wells was extremely successful, not everyone respected his work or his predictions. Another well-known science fiction writer, Jules Verne, viciously attacked him for works such as The First Man in the Moon, which Verne argued weren't rooted in scientific fact at all. That's right. Now, Wells wrote a number of other utopian visions of the future. Jason? Yes. In a modern utopia published in 1905, his vision was of a world where there's no private property, where everyone has access to wonderful health care, and interestingly, where everyone's personal information is stored on cards in a central database outside Paris. Apart from the healthcare, I'm not sure everyone today would see that as a positive view of the future. Neither am I. And, on a similar note, Wells strongly believed in population control and in The Shape of Things to Come, which was published in 1933, he sees and supports a world where the population is kept at 2 billion. Once again, I'm not sure most people today would necessarily see that as a good thing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Gitanjali, in your research, did you come across anything about the world brain? Yes, I did. It's actually very interesting. Throughout the 1930s, Wells predicted and supported the setting up of a huge world encyclopedia. And towards the end of the decade, in 1938, he wrote a series of essays called World Brain. In these essays, he called for the world to make use of modern technology to create an enormous global encyclopedia so that all our knowledge is available to all people, not just an educated elite. Wells envisioned this as probably being on microfilm. He thought it would allow anyone, anywhere in the world, to look at any book or any document. He also thought it would be created by everyone, once again, not just by an elite. Yes, and as you can imagine, many people today say that the Internet has basically fulfilled his prediction. Of course, it doesn't use microfilm, but essentially, it does meet all Wells' main requirements. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. And you'll hear an introduction about the process of producing stamps. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Tell Me More, the programme where you ask the questions and we provide the answers. And we've had a wide variety of questions from you this week. And the subject we've picked for you this week, in response to your many letters, is the production of postage stamps. And as usual, we've been doing our homework on the subject. So, who designs the postage stamps that we stick on our letters? Well, in Australia, the design of postage is in the hands of Australia Post. In Britain, it's the Royal Mail that looks after stamps, and it seems that both countries have a similar approach to the production process. We discovered, to our surprise, that it can take up to two years to produce a new postage stamp. Why is that, I hear you ask? Surprisingly, it can't be all that difficult to design a stamp. In fact, it isn't, but it seems it's a lengthy business. Firstly, they have to choose the subjects, and this is done with the help of market research. Members of the general public, including families, are surveyed to find out what sorts of things they would like to see on their stamps. They are given a list of possible topics and asked to rank them. A list is then presented to the advisory committee, which meets about once a month. The committee is made up of outside designers, graphic artists and stamp collectors. If the committee likes the list, it sends it up to the board of directors, which makes the final decision. Then they commission an artist. In Australia, artists are paid $1,500 for a stamp design and a further $800 if the committee actually decides to use the design. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So there's a possibility that a stamp might be designed, but still never actually go into circulation. So what kind of topics are acceptable? Well, the most important thing is that they must be of national interest. And because a stamp needs to represent the country in some way, characters from books are popular, or you often find national animals and birds. So, of course, the kangaroo is a favourite in Australia. With the notable exception of members of the British royal family stamps, no living people ever appear on Australian or British stamps. Every year, the Royal Mail in Britain receives about 2,000 ideas for stamps, but very few of them are ever used. One favourite topic is kings and queens, for instance, King Henry VIII, famous for his six wives, has recently appeared on a British stamp together with a stamp featuring each of his wives. But despite the extensive research which is done before a stamp is produced, it seems it's hard to please everybody. And apparently all sorts of people write to the post office to say that they loved or hated a particular series. The stamp to cause the most concern ever in Australia was a picture of Father Christmas surfing at the beach. And when you consider that the practical function of a stamp is only as a receipt for postage, I think perhaps the importance accorded to stamps has got out of all proportion. Well, that's all for today. If there's a subject you want us to tell you more about, drop us a line at... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. 
hear an extract from a talk given by a lecturer from management department of a university on the topic job satisfaction. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Job satisfaction is how happy an individual is with his or her job. Scholars and human resource professionals generally make a distinction between effective job satisfaction and cognitive job satisfaction. Effective job satisfaction is the overall extent of pleasurable emotional feelings individuals have about their jobs and is different from cognitive job satisfaction which is the extent of individual satisfaction with particular facets of their jobs such as pay, pension, arrangements, working hours and numerous other aspects of their jobs. At its most gender level of conceptualization, job satisfaction is simply how content an individual is with his or her job. Effective job satisfaction is usually defined as a one-dimensional subjective construct representing an overall emotional feeling individuals have about their job as a whole. Hence, effective job satisfaction for individuals reflects the degree of pleasure or happiness the job in general induces. Cognitive job satisfaction is usually defined as being a more objective and logical evaluation of various facets of a job. As such, cognitive job satisfaction can be one-dimensional if it comprises evaluation of just one aspect of a job, such as pay or maternity leave, or multidimensional if two or more facets of a job are simultaneously evaluated. Environmental Factors one of the most significant aspects of an individual's work in a modern organization concerns the management of communication demands that he or she encounters on the job. Demands can be characterized as a communication load. Individuals in an organization can experience communication overload and communication underload which can affect their level of job satisfaction. Communication overload can occur when an individual receives loads of message in a short period of time which can result in unprocessed information or when an individual faces more complex messages that are more difficult to process. Due to this process, given an individual's style of work and motivation to complete a task, when more inputs exist than outputs, the individual perceives a condition of overload which can be positively or negatively related to job satisfaction. In comparison, communication under load can occur when messages or inputs are sent below the individual's ability to process them. According to the ideas of communication over load and under load, if an individual does not receive enough input on the job or is unsuccessful in processing these inputs, the individual is more likely to become dissatisfied, aggravated and unhappy with their work that leads to a low level of job satisfaction. Superior subordinate communication Superior subordinate communication is an important influence on job satisfaction in the workplace. The way in which subordinates perceive a superior's behavior can positively or negatively influence job satisfaction. Communication behavior such as facial expression, eye contact, vocal expression, and body movement is crucial to the superior subordinate relationship. Nonverbal messages play a central role in interpersonal interactions with respect to impression formation, deception, attraction, social influence, and emotional bonding. Individuals who dislike and think negatively about their supervisor 
are less willing to communicate or have motivation to work, whereas individuals who like and think positively of their supervisor are more likely to communicate and are satisfied with their job and work environment. A supervisor who uses non-verbal immediacy, friendliness and open communication lines is more likely to receive positive feedback and high job satisfaction from a subordinate. Strategic Employee Recognition Employee recognition is not only about gifts and points. It's about changing the corporate culture in order to meet goals and initiatives and most importantly to connect employees to the company's core values and beliefs. Strategic employee recognition is seen as the most important program not only to improve employee retention and motivation but also to positively influence the financial situation. The vast majority of companies want to be innovative, coming up with new products, business models and better ways of doing things. However, innovation is not so easy to achieve. A CEO cannot just order it and so it will be achieved. You have to carefully manage an organization so that, over time, innovations will emerge. Individual factors Mood and emotions form the effective element of job satisfaction. Moods tend to be long-lasting, but often weaker states of uncertain origins, while emotions are often more intense, short-lived and have a clear object or cause. Positive and negative emotions were also found to be significantly related to overall job satisfaction. It was found that suppression of unpleasant emotions decreases job satisfaction and the amplification of pleasant emotions increases job satisfaction. There are two personality factors related to job satisfaction, alienation and locus of control. Employees who have an internal locus of control and feel less alienated are more likely to experience job satisfaction, job involvement and organizational commitment. The characteristics like high self-esteem, self-efficacy and low neuroticism are also related to job satisfaction. That is the end of